Hi everybody, I'm in beautiful Naples, Florida. The sounds you're hearing are chirping and, and the wind and I'm looking up at palm trees that you can't see and I'm here with the appropriately named Dr. Larry Brilliant who is a uh, spectacularly expert and, and smart, just plain oh. smart, uh, epidemiologist, physician, entrepreneur, and um, an all-around nice guy who I've recently met and who has special expertise in infectious diseases. And for those of you who don't know, uh, he uh, saw the last case of smallpox ever. He was in India for uh, the last case of polio there, right? That's right. And you've spent your, your career um, really in this field of epidemiology and trying to figure out infectious diseases. What do you do with them? How do you predict them? How do you manage them? So, uh, of course, as an expert, you can give us some special insight into coronavirus. Um, right now, and I'm going to date this, uh, February 24th, 2020 at 11 a.m. in Florida. Uh, where are we with the epidemic uh, now? So I think the corona epidemic has reached the point where we can safely say it's a pandemic. There'll be some argument about the legal meaning of that, but a pandemic is an epidemic that perpetuates itself on two continents or more at the same time and I, I clearly and just to be there. clear you know the WHO hasn't yet officially declared it that but yet when you speak with experts public health experts as I have they're all saying we're kind of on the verge of it. and WHO has declared it a public health emergency of international concern a FIAC which doesn't have the same impact as saying pandemic but mm -hmm. pandemic's actually a lousy word we used to have a word epidemic shakespearean i plague upon your house mm -hmm. and epidemos is on the people i guess they wanted to make it something more than that so they came up with a neologism pandemic which means all the people doesn't give you the information i'll tell you what it's not it's not the zombie apocalypse this is not going to be a mass extinction event it's going to be a rough ride we should understand that it is probably in most countries by now even though only 35 or 40 countries are reporting. The major reason countries may not report is they don't have a testing kit or a testing facility to know the difference between a coronavirus infection and influenza or malaria. There are only two countries in all of Africa that have the ability to make that distinction. So it's not surprising that today for the first time we heard about Afghanistan and Iran, all these other places, Iran, which is exploding now, um, this is something to worry about, but it's really something to plan for. We need to increase public health awareness, public health facilities, surge capacities at hospitals, an understanding of how we test people to know that they have had the disease and they're now immune and can re-enter the workforce because we're going to need policemen and firemen and construction workers and we're going to want to know that it's safe for them to go out into mass gatherings and not spread the disease. We're also going to have to really be careful that we can pick up new cases as they come into new areas, and we're going to have to understand what happens with mass gatherings, which are echo chambers. But we have a lot of work to do. Uh, this is going to be a bumpy ride. It is not the end of the world. It is going to cause us economic, emotional, and political distortion. Now, um, we have a lot of experience, you know, it's been one thing after the other, right? It's uh, MERS and SARS, H1N1 and SARS and Ebola and Zika. Do you think we're learning the lessons appropriately? I mean, we've gotten a little better at this, that, and the other thing. Are we learning it appropriately? Uh, I'm glad you said, John, one thing after the other. It, it's actually one thing and another as part of a third thing, which are mass spillover events as heretofore only animal viruses have jumped into humans. And that's happening because of modernity, because we're cutting down the rainforest, because we're plowing under trees, because we have animals and humans living so close to each other now, because we consume more meat, and in some places, because we consume the meat of wild animals. These viruses have been here for a very long time. We are now sharing these viruses, more than 50 of them, in the last 30 years. And some of them are very dangerous, some of them are mild. These zoonotic diseases that create new emerging infections, they are something we are not paying enough attention to. It is impossible to raise money for groups like Ending Pandemics and all these groups that are trying to work unless there is a pandemic. And then for a while, the spotlight turns on that. Everybody's worried about it. And then 
as things settle down, the spotlight moves on to something else. Now, I was surprised to hear about some of the groups you're a member of in terms of pandemics. Could you just mention that? So Ending Pandemics, I'm the chairman of that. That's a group that works uh, with, among other things, CORDS. That is 27 countries, four global organizations, including WHO. And Do you say CORDS? CORDS, C-O-R-D-S, uh -huh. Connecting Organizations for Regional Disease Surveillance. Unfortunately, my world is a world of acronyms. Mm -hmm. I apologize for it. Uh, but EpiCore, the group of epidemiologists who learn how to interpret digital uh, healthcare systems and digital disease surveillance itself. These new systems in Thailand, Dr. Me, in the in England and the U.S., uh, we have flu tracker and flu near you that help us find these outbreaks of these new diseases faster and respond to them quicker. What are some of the things you mentioned it briefly last night when we were talking that people might not know about in terms of new tools? You use like social tracking and. Yeah, I mean, the same things that uh, social media allows us to do. So, for example, when I was at Google, we put together something called uh, Google Flu Trends that uh, used the, all of Google's experience to predict where the next influenza outbreak would be. Uh, that's a unidirectional system. You're just querying querying big data. But now there's some incredibly interesting bidirectional systems, uh, like Flu Near You in the United States and Australia Flu Tracker, where people opt in, they report their health status and, and their, uh, their temperature, sometimes and the symptoms, and if there is an outbreak, they can be notified where to get a vaccine and where to get help. These are really good systems that we will be relying on in the coming months. To finish up, um, how can you put this in perspective for people? Uh, big, biggest misconception and a, a way to tell people uh, you know, how worried they should be. Everybody wants to know that. I worked on the movie Contagion. I was the science advisor for that. I think that we tried to put pandemics in their proper perspective. What is a bad pandemic? What happens? We wanted to make the science impeccable so nobody thought it was a zombie movie. This is not 1918. We're flu, big flu epidemic. Big flu epidemic where between 50 and 100 million people were killed at a time that the population of the world was between 2 and 3 billion. So third or a quarter of what it is now. But this is not like seasonal flu. Seasonal flu kills 650,000 people every year. Um, worldwide. Worldwide, but 45, 50,000 mm -hmm. people this year in the United States alone. This is a more dangerous disease because it has a higher case fatality rate, because it spreads more quickly, because it shows up in a disruptive way. So we have to honor it. again. Pay attention to the public health care system, invest in hospitals, invest in personal hygiene. Masks are good, but they're good because they protect you from infecting others. Wash your hands, take good care, and love everybody and be part of your community. And then again, just to put in perspective, the masks, you know, we think it may be, if it's spread by droplet, it's not perfect. It may give some partial protection uh, because, of course, the virus itself is 0.1 microns, so it's, it could go through a mask. and. And even an N95 has to be, which is 0.3 microns. Uh, exactly. It has to be exactly. perfectly fitted. Um, and then, in terms of mortality, it's a little bit over two. It's a little bit over two percent right now. But it'll but go we, down. Right, because we think maybe maybe could be ten times or even more that are not. We don't even know about. They're asymptomatic or they're very small symptoms or we're not diagnosed. It. So at the end of the day, if it gets closer to one in a thousand mortality, that's closer to the flu. The flu is one in a thousand. It may be a little bit worse than that. Maybe it's a bad flu season. But to put it in perspective right now, uh, in, in February of 2020, the latest thing I looked at the CDC, there were 26 million cases of flu in the That's United right. States with 14,000 right. deaths. So I just want to add one more shot. thing. Yeah. All these things we're talking about, and, and John, you're absolutely right, a mask is imperfect, uh, washing hands are imperfect, quarantine is imperfect, but they are speed bumps. Mm -hmm. And the more speed bumps that we can put in the path of a virus before it goes global, before it begins to spread faster, the better off we are. If we give a virus that has, as you say, a replication rate of two to three. Mm -hmm. If we give it a six month head start, there could be billions of cases before we find it. Early detection, early response, rapid and proper care of our pub public health care system, those are the keys. And of course, why do we want to delay it? We're not just delaying the inevitable, we're delaying it until we could get a vaccine up and running. And spectacularly, 
the NIH and others, Tony Fauci yep. and Moderna yep. uh, up in Massachusetts, they're partnering. And it used, with SARS, Tony told me that Tony's the head of the uh, National Institutes of Health Wonderful Infectious guy. Diseases yeah. uh, and, and, and doing a million, million things at once right now. But he said, I think with SARS, it took 20 months for a vaccine to be developed, and then it got shorter and shorter and shorter. And w now this is about two to three months to actually make the right. vaccine, but now it has to go into f phase right. one and phase two and phase three. Uh, and so it could be about a year before really, uh, if everything goes right. But uh, think about that. The, the, it's, it's a month or two now to make the vaccine, but to get it where we need to have it in global distribution, it is not a, um, it, it's what we call an, uh, a market failure. We don't invest enough in making vaccines, which are a public good. We need them, but it's very hard to make a vaccine against a new virus that nobody has seen before and get it out into the field before a year. But we'll end with something optimistic and spectacular, which is this vaccine is basically cannibalizing previous vaccines. That's right. So Zika, uh, they, it was a plasmid. It was They took the piece of genetic material out of it that codes specifically for Zika. They replaced it with one that's code specifically for the coronavirus spike, the thing that makes that unique. And boom, it was almost a computer problem that they, they made the recipe in a couple of hours and that's they right. gave it up to Moderna. They got the sequence from uh, China on a Friday and by Saturday they had shipped it over a couple of days later up to Moderna and it's going to just take a month. So were you, if you're wondering where your money should be spent, it's not uh, reacting where it's a little bit too late often, but uh, trying to say, how do we look forward to I, what the next thing I, is? I, I want to end on something really uh, optimistic and exciting. I mean, we eradicated smallpox, the first disease in human history, which had killed 500 million people in the 20th century. And we did it with people who looked like all the colors of the rainbow, every religion, every nationality, 150 countries who came together in a spirit of goodwill to conquer that disease. That's what we need right now. We need global goodwill working together. All right, and with that, Dr. Larry, brilliant. We'll just prove that we're down in Florida and we can let you leave with a little moment.